Good afternoon. Hope you're all having a good time. Hope you're enjoying the summit. My name is Kyle Warhand. I'm a global technology advisor here at C3, and I have the pleasure of introducing our 145 session of amplifying the human connection and the evolution of collaboration. So we've got a couple CIO juggernauts here. Uh, please welcome to the stage Milos Topec, VP of IT and digital, Chief Digital Officer for Grand Valley State University, and Gary Sorrentino, Global Chief Information Officer at Zoom. Put your hands together, please. Oh, these lights are bright. Uh, oh. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. Before we get into our regularly scheduled programming, if you can join me for a second in just thanking our amazing hosts from C3 for putting this event together and bringing us all <laughs> into this space. So, um, Gary and I, wow, look, that's the picture before I had beard. <laughs> um, Gary and I have met several years ago when you have occupied, at that point, a deputy CIO role with Zoom. And we've had the pleasure of chatting about different things and the way we see life and the way we see our roles and our impact on the people we serve. But before we begin and we get into some kind of practical, hands-on experiences from our careers, who is Gary Sorrentino? Wow, that's a good question. Um, who is Gary Sorrentino? So I'm in technology maybe, I think it's almost 44 years now. Uh, I started uh, right after high school. I've been through either repair, programming, management, something. Um, I spent most of the bulk of my career on Wall Street uh, with some of the largest banks in the world. My last one was JP Morgan. And in 2019, I retired on Halloween. And three weeks later, I met this incredible gentleman and his name was Eric Yuan. I got all the questions wrong, because now here I'm at Zoom five years. Uh, but it's been a great journey. It's been, I've seen, I have seen this industry from many, many sides of it, and uh, the last five years has been uh, so much different than the rest of my career. Uh, that's probably question number three or four. We're gonna compare, contrast some of those experiences. You and I talked in the past, and we both believe that people come first, they absolutely matter the most. And a lot of the tools and technologies are simply that. They're tools that are meant to make all of our lives better and easier. How do you embed those principles in your own leadership style, people you lead? You know, one of the questions I asked Gary before we got on the stage, I said, where are you spending most of your time? And his answer was on United, right? So having this global role of a CIO of a major company and, and traveling and getting the message across, but how do you embed that leadership style that it always starts with people first? And then how does that translate into the way the broader executive team at Zoom performs? So I think people first is very important. I think today leaders need to uh, empower, their, empower their employees, empower the people that they work with. You know, I, I love to say this. Um, I spend half my life running after them, which I think is the greatest thing in the world because you have to empower them to do the best they can uh, small course con adjustments if needed. Sometimes I just might know something they wouldn't know. But I think at the end of the day, it really is about how do we empower people to do their very best without some of the leadership overhang that we've all been in love with. I mean, quick show of hands. Who loves micromanagement? There you go, right? So the best thing is if you don't love it, don't do it. And um, I'm fortunate um, for my last couple of jobs, I've always had um, people who work for me who can run on their own which is what I love, and I love spending half my life chasing after them. Um, that's the greatest part of my job, is chasing after them for me to catch up. The second part you asked about the leadership team is I think that's how the leadership team at Zoom runs. It's very people-centric. We are a um, love and happiness company. Uh, our goals is how do we work together but independent? How do we allow people to grow? Um, and I think you actually see it in the product because even, not a product plug, but as you see it in the product is we talk about human to human connection and how people wanna uh, collaborate. How do they wanna be productive? How do they wanna work together in this new world? And so you see it in our leadership style, but you also see it, see it in how we seed the product. So things change, uh, technology evolves, moves fast in some cases. 
organizations and people can make their own decisions whether they want to be engaged in part of that journey or not, and then obviously take the outcome that comes on the other side of that, whether you are staying relevant in the year you actually live in. I think it would be interesting to hear from you when it comes to that growth or, or kind of expansion and evolution of collaboration. How would you say, where are we now? And maybe do a little bit of comparison of, of where were we three or four years ago, let's say prior to the pandemic, and maybe a little bit of visionary input from you, where do you see us in another three or four years? Yeah. Where we are now is where we've never been before. And I know that just sounds a little cliche there, but one of the reasons I'm really happy I'm still in technology is for the first time, technology is actually changing the way people work. For the first time. We've made small changes along the way. We've added tools, but we're really changing the way people work. And that's due to a lot. Prior, we had a way of working. We were a different generation of worker. A lot of us didn't grow up on glass. A lot of us aren't familiar with technology. A lot of us lived in a baby boomer led environment. And, and the rules were a little different then, right? It was, well, let's put it this way. During the pandemic, how many companies out there actually forced you to go back five days a week? Raise your hand, right? But some of the more forward companies said, let people adjust. Let them figure out where they work the right way. Well, we didn't see that 10 years ago. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing, um, and I'm one, okay, the boomer mentality, whether by age or just change of mentality moving out, and we're seeing a more Gen X leadership moving in, which bravo. Um, I also think that we're seeing new employees come in who are forcing us to change the way that we work. The wonderful Gen Zs, they're, they're wicked smart. They're, they're unbelievable. They have their own way of working. If there's Gen Zs out there, don't stop. Keep pushing the company. But I think what we're seeing now is an inflection point. We're seeing where people want to work differently, and that's OK, because there are great platforms like Zoom out there that said, it's OK if you want to work synchronously and you want to work on audio or you want to write. But it's okay if you want to work asynchronously and you want to work on video and you don't want to type, you want to talk, or you want AI to do some of the work. And I know I was the first one to say AI on that one. We had a challenge about saying AI. But at the end of the Gentlemen's day... Gentlemen's bet a dollar. <laughs> but at the end... I'm sure it's going to cost you more than a dollar. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, though, we're, ch we're moving towards a different way of working, a different style of working, a more um, asynchronous working. In some cases, we're group thinking a little more than we used to be. And I think today, the workers, all of us, are changing. I know if I, if I ask for a show of hands, and some will admit it and some won't, there's four, at least four generations working here in the audience, right? Right? I mean, who, let's see, let's see honesty, okay? Who's the boomers? Okay? Who's the Gen Xs? Yeah. Who's the millennials? All right, here's the one of no representation. Who's the Gen Zs? I got a couple of hands out there, right? But think about workers today. I want everybody who's a boomer to think this way. Are you really a boomer anymore? Or are you starting to work asynchronous? Are you starting to figure out there are other ways to working? So today, really today's worker is really what I want to call the hybrid worker, the new worker, a person who is grabbing attributes from all. And that's where I think work is changing now. Um, we got a few minutes. I'm going to tell you a quick story. Okay, I think I am the oldest person at Zoom. I don't know if that's to be proud of or not. My first day at Zoom, I did this. I clicked up this thing. Remember this thing? What do we call it? What do we call this for the boomers? Phone, right? Today you got to go like this, but I'll use this. And I called someone on my first day. And it said call declined. I was like, in my old life, my, my, my banking life, we would go see this person with a copy of the org chart, make sure they understood you know, where we were. About two seconds later, a box pops up. It says, welcome to Zoom. I'm sure whatever you need, we can handle over chat. OK, for everybody who snickered, what do you do? Do you call again, or do you <laughs> chat your question? Chat your question. I chatted my question. Five minutes later, I got the answer. You know what I learned? I can't be a boomer. You know, what I, you know what I learned? I need to figure out how people want to work with me, and I need to adapt because we have to meet in the middle. So I called the person up and I said, okay, when I finally met the person, 
I will not call you. I will chat you whatever I need unless it's an emergency. And emergencies will be less than 5% of the time. So if I actually ring your phone, I'm in an emergency and I need a synchronous answer. But if I don't need the answer right away, I will respect the way you work and I'll work asynchronously. So we're all different. So I think to answer the question is, we're at this inflection point now where people are learning how to work different regardless of the generation. And I think what we're going to see going forward is we're going to see new ways of working, right? We're going to see AI bots. We're going to see digital twins. We're going to see today that people are going to augment themselves with some of the greatest tools that we talked about today to help them work a different way. I think that's my little future view. I think what you shared resonated with um, a lot of the folks in the audience. And I think the alignment is often based on the role you fulfill at that moment in time, right? If you have to staff a physical location and your clients or partners or customers are walking into that space, someone needs to be there, yep. right? You can alternate shifts and so forth. And if you're a, you know, a coder or a developer and you love to sit behind six screens and you want to do that in your basement, have at it. Uh, but in the last, especially in the last maybe 18 months, I think you've provided a very accurate picture of where we are and how we come from different backgrounds and different experiences and different skill sets and different preferences, all of which matter and are important. But I know you spent over 20 years in financial services back east, and we're not going to name them, people or companies, you know who they are. But there's been a growing shift in that pendulum swinging in the last 18 months of some of these corporate senior executives mandating the five hours back in the office, everybody's got to be there whether one of them that's not going to be mentioned spent a billion dollars to build a new headquarters in Manhattan, um, or, and you can Google that, or Chad GPT it, um, or, or somebody else. What are some of the things from your perspective and the way some of the organizations where you have worked um, have experienced that they tend not to see? Do you believe that a lot of them, because especially in the financial services, or in publicly traded, traded companies, a lot of them live and die by quarterly earnings calls. There's the profit margin. There's a lot of other things to consider. What are they missing? And maybe what, was, what would be some of the advice from you for them to consider as we navigate our path forward together? Well, the good news is I know most of them. So, so at the end of the day, it's, it's really about my advice to them would be you have to wake up and realize what today's date is. All right? You have to manage for the future. You have to build staff. You can't be a company where the smartest people in the world don't want to come and work. Okay? You can't have 48%. You know what's 48% of all Gen Zs will quit in one year? 48%? Can you imagine hiring 100 people in your company and 50 walk out? You'll never make your headcount number. And when we talk to them about why they're walking out, the company lied to me. Hmm, what does lied mean? Well, I signed an employment agreement 9 to 5, and it's 10 o'clock at night, and I'm still here. They told me that they had bleeding edge, leading edge tools, and yet uh, there's no AI running here yet for everybody. And so I think that my note to them would be, and it's not just Wall Street. We see it in law firms and things like that, is you really need to start surrounding, the company needs to start embracing the year that they're in and the direction that workers are going. I can't, I can't say that enough. What did Gretzky say? I'm sorry, too many of you are aligning yourselves to where the puck is, okay? You really need to look at where the puck's going. Great keynote this morning. He talked about Gen A's. He already talked about the way Gen, a Gen A's are 12 years old, and we are already starting to see. And look at what you do. You see them before we see them, right? As they come through the education system, you do a great job turning them into the workers that we're going to see later. But you, we're seeing Gen A's today we're seeing characteristics. How many people have a Gen a, Gen a home? How many people have a Gen Z home? How many people have a millennial home? Yep. To, for those hands that went up, 18% of all millennials still live with their parents, believe it or not. But at the end of the day, we're seeing a, a generation that's changing around us. Now, remember, the, the Gen Zs have a little problems with the millennials. You know why? They look at the millennials as older brothers and sisters. Okay. What do you think the Gen Z A's are going to have by the time they get here with the Gen Z's? They're going to see 
These are my older. Now, I don't know who has, who has brothers and sisters. You get along famously with them, right? No. <laughs> and imagine if you're at work with them. Different ideals, different ways you work. So I think those companies really need to take a, a forward view. They need to do more. They need to be like a football team. Football teams used to look at, professional football teams looked at college. Now they look at high school. Now they're looking at junior high school, right? Pretty soon they're going to be looking at kindergartners. But at the end of the day, I think they need to spend more time realizing the energy that's coming and the changes that are coming, and they need to plan for that if they want to still be the largest bank in the world or the second largest bank in the world. Um, once my friends set all retire, you'll see a different change. I think the gen, the gen, for the Gen Xs out there, please, you're going to be the next leaders of the world, okay? You, millennials, you're going to be the next managers of the world, and Gen Zs, by 2030, you're going to be in those power positions, right? Don't follow the people that came before you. Make your own way. Think out of the box, right? Figure out how people in your company want to work, and you said a key thing, frontline workers versus developers. One size will never, ever, ever fit all, and people need to be adaptive. You know, we all know what the future of work is, right? We've heard that, right? And there's six tenants. The next stage, according to people like the World Economic Forum, is a human-centric era. That's what's going to replace future of work. And what that says is we have to start designing for the workers that are coming, not the workers that are here. Right? Because we have to be prepared for that next type of work, and it has nothing to do with generations. Was that a good message I should send? Yeah, I think it's a wonderful... It's going to end up uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm going to get nasty uh, notes. No, that's okay. It's okay. Leadership is a lonely position, a lonely sport, and you got to build some uh, toughness along the way if you believe in what you're doing. One of the things you said, you talked about a 12-year-old. Um, you know, sometimes you need interpretation. Uh, in, in the way they communicate, the way they do things. My 12-year-old around the house goes and calls everybody bruh, uh, to, to which my, my wife doesn't take too kindly. She goes, I'm not, I'm your mom, I'm not your bruh. And his response is like, got it, bruh. So we're trying to figure out some things, but you, you, set, up, you set up a really nice intro into my next kind of follow-up question. What is Zoom seeing as some of their priorities at this moment in time to lead this market and for it to be more relevant and to understand, like you said, there are different ways and different modes of communicating, different preferences, different experiences, different moments in time where you may be limited with access to tools and technologies, whether it's a zip code, socioeconomic status, you just happen to be in the middle of Upper Peninsula in the woods and you don't have that access. What are some of the tools and technologies and priorities that Zoom as, an, as a company, as organizations, has placed ahead of themselves and you're looking to maybe create a different segment of this market that we've been in in recent years? So, so I think Zoom, Zoom is about this. Zoom is, most people know us from meeting. A lot of people know us from phone. A lot of people know us from contact center. But Zoom is really a platform for human to human connection. And that's what our goal is. How does one human interact with another human? Okay, then how does two interact with two? How does one interact with a conference room? Maybe we don't interact over video all the time. Maybe it's just a chat client, right? At the end of the day, our goal was this. Analyze how, how humans want to react or interact or collaborate or produce results and figure out how to augment that. Right? And I think that's what it is. I don't know if we're going to have a tool that says if you're completely offline, but we will have different variations of how people to connect. If you want to work synchronously, go right ahead. If you want to work asynchronously, go right ahead. If the team works multiple ways, go right ahead. Just all meet in the middle. As long as there's something in the middle that can bring you together and allow you to a point to work completely different. Now, if it's a complete synchronous project, product, or product, and you need something tonight, you have to, people have to adjust. I'm talking about for the normal part of it. Allow me to work how I think I can do well, and that's what Zoom focuses on. Um, we even came out with, what if two of us meet, I don't know, I wanted to call it Zoom at the bar I lost, but um, what if we wanted to meet over a drink later? And we did really, really well, and we discussed things that were important. Which one of us took notes? No one. 
that conversation could be lost. So we're now coming out with something, it's not a commercial, called in-person meeting where Zoom will go with you. So now I could put it down here. We could have this preview, say this was a prep, right? And then at the end, we get, we get all the summary, we get the transcript, we get everything, it blocks everybody else out, right? Because we're not gonna be on a Zoom call, we're not gonna be on a Zoom phone, we're, kind of, we're gonna just be two people talking. And so Zoom is looking for how do we bring the power of a Zoom platform where, and I go back to the beginning, humans to humans connect. And I think that's really as we're looking forward. My, my pitch would be, since you said, having a conversation in a bar, call it back of the napkin. So I think it would resonate yes. with a lot of people. So we actually, when you draw that on a napkin and it looks cool, we take a picture of the napkin, turn it into a whiteboard, and you can send it to your teams that goes, hey, Gary and I solved this. Here's, it's a whiteboard, start awesome. working on it. Wonderful. So you mentioned AI a couple of times in one of your earlier answers. Um, again, to all of our marketing friends in the room and all, especially amazing, wonderful marketing team at C3, this is not my opinion, but a friend of mine and a, and a marketing executive from Madison Ave in New York many years ago in a bar in the city said, marketers ruin everything, right? They get something, they hype it up. When ChatGPT came out several years ago publicly to the broader consumption, and then Copilot and AI Companion and many others, all of a sudden every company was AI company overnight. And if you really start unpacking and peeling that onion, you realize that a lot of vaporware and a lot of marketing jargon and fluff. You know, I met with a company at one point who claimed to be a transformational AI solution, and the level of technology intelligence was autocomplete and spell check, right, which we've had for a while. Right. Where is AI's place in the world today and where do you see some examples that are practical that our folks in this room can actually take home or take to their organizations and learn more about? Where have you seen so, it used well? So first, let's start with this. AI is a tool, not a solution, right? When someone says install AI, quite frankly, what the hell does that mean? That's like saying install HTML, install Fortran, install Pascal, right? They're tools, okay? They're tools looking to create a solution. Really what they should be saying is, in, put something into my organization that makes people more productive. But the buzzword of AI is there. A board the other day, I, I, one of the speakers this morning, he said about sprinkling stuff on, he says the board said go buy more AI. How do you buy more AI? Right, but it's this, this nomenclature that we got into. So first of all, let's just understand that AI is like buying a hammer. Okay, unless you know what to do with the hammer, you can't build a house, right? And a lot of us are going out and buying these hammers and we're giving them to the employees and we're saying, you have AI now. Now, I can let 18% of you go next year. I don't know if you saw Harvard Business Review. It had a, an announcement. It said, uh, CEOs, please don't fire 10% of the staff next year due to AI savings. We're not seeing it, right? And now many companies are saying that they're seeing productivity improvements because they want to see productivity improvements right now. And so I think the way we have to look at AI is we have found a technology that is gonna change the world, but we have to figure out how to harness it and use it correctly. We have to make different generations curious about it. We have to make different generations aware and maybe a little bit of afraid of it because depending on where you are in that generational, some are shying away and some are just putting the keys to the jungle out there and getting companies in trouble. So I really think that companies today need to sit back and first figure out how is AI gonna augment human intelligence, not replace it. I think that's important. I think um, maybe it was HBR, maybe it was um, Bill McDermott who might have said it from ServiceNow. AI are not, is not gonna replace humans. AI is not gonna replace humans. Humans with AI will replace humans without AI. I think that's really the way to look at it, right? Is that how do we enable people? How do we augment it? We used to say um, smarter, not harder. How about we say intelligent, not smarter anymore, right? How do we make people get up that curve with AI and get to a point where it's helping me? Now, we've heard all about this, summaries, meeting summaries. We do the same thing, right? But after a while, people stop listening to the summaries. People stop reading the summaries. Memorization has worked pretty well for us most of our lives. And we, how many people still take notes when the meeting has a note taker on it? 
Yeah, why? Right? At the end of the day, it's because you take better notes. You understand it better. The way you learned in school is if you write it, you remember it, right? And so there's all these things that are going on. So it really is about how do we figure out how to make something work better using AI? Okay, that's the first part. Second part, you said an example. There's a great tool out there that most of the AI companies support, mine also. Does anybody ever use in-meeting questions? You know what I'm talking about? No, most people don't know what this is. Okay, write that down as a note. In, yeah, write down the note because they're not taking it. Here's what in-meeting does, and I, I'm a storyteller, so sorry. I was on with a CIO of one of, our, one of our clients, and he was having a problem with Zoom. Unfortunately, I couldn't attend the meeting the next day because, well, believe it or not, I was on a stage presenting. But I prepped my team and said, this is the, what you need to have this meeting. Okay. Now, they go and have the meeting. I get off stage. The meeting's 10 minutes left. On my way to the room, because I want to join the last few minutes of the meeting, I, go, I open up my phone and I join the meeting. Okay, now for all you people out there, my team and the client are yelling at the top of their lungs using words I can't use on this stage. What's the first thing do you do? Hang up like it never happened, right? <laughs> no, the first thing I said was, okay, this meeting's gone off the rails. I need to fix this. I run back to the room. I open up Zoom. I get on the Zoom call. And before I announce myself, I said to Zoom, whatever the CIO's name is, what are the three top things the CIO cares about? And Zoom goes, boom, boom, boom. I get on the call. I go, oh, I'm so sorry. Everybody's yelling and screaming. I'm sorry I missed the end of it. Look, Joe, oh, that's what I'm saying. That's his name. Joe, I think the three things we need to take away from this meeting are X, Y, and Z. He turns around to the 20 people on the call and goes, he hasn't even been on the call the entire time, and he knows exactly what I want. Do I tell him that came from AI, or do I just take the victory lap and keep moving? But think about how important that feature is to be on a call you get there late. You don't understand what someone's saying. You know what? After, wouldn't it be great if after this was done, you can just go to your little iPhone and say, summarize what that guy Gary said. And you get it right on the phone, right? Without these in-meeting questions. This is just one of the power tools that you have to enable. Imagine while your client's talking, you're a private banker, okay? You're asking the AI note taker, what are the three things he said? So at the end of the meeting, you go, I'm so Mr. Smith, I think the three things that are important to you most are generational wealth, uh, I don't, protection of principle, and providing for your family and future generations. You didn't have to take notes because just before they were done speaking, you asked the tool to do it. Those are the secret nuggets you gotta look for. Those things that, that will really add to the level. If you did that at the end of the meeting and at the end of the meeting you said, okay, so I'm gonna summarize this meeting with these three things that was written by an AI engine that was probably 99% accurate, how smart would you look? Right? How engaged. You might have missed half the meeting and fell asleep. Doesn't really matter, right? Because at the end of that meeting, you could have been off camera for 45 or 50 minutes, right? But all you knew is you summarized at the end like you were a thousand percent engaged. And this is just one of the things to embrace. Find something that makes you more productive and then embrace that. I think I have time for a question. I, would, I was just gonna say you and I can sit, you know, sit here and talk for hours. Um, we have a few minutes left. I would love to turn it over to the audience. I, I saw a couple of mics in different places in the room. Uh, please raise your hand, walk up to a mic, and ask Gary a question. Yes, please. I, you have to go back by the mic. I'm sorry. I wish I could hear you. All I heard was great session. I agree. <laughs> Uh, great session, and I think one of the questions that was asked is uh, some of the companies are going back to uh, five days a week, and from, a, from what is it that is lacking from the tools that we have today that some companies feel that we need to get back? You know, I don't think, I'm going to go on a limb here. It's not a tool thing. It's a leadership perception thing right now. I'm gonna be clear on that because I, everyone here during the pandemic has decided how they work best, true? Everyone is fighting, sometimes their employers, to figure out how to get back to where I work best. And I think that that's the change we're gonna see. 
I think part of it is a mistrust. Now, look, are there a couple of us out there who when we say that we're working from home, we're fishing or out, out, out on a four hour lunch? Yes, okay? And I'm fortunate it makes it bad for the rest of us. But I think today we are gonna see the world. Who just said it? Somebody, oh, Jamie just said it, believe it or not. He said the world might get to a three and a half day work week, right? And here's a person in the other side of his breath says make sure you're at work five days a week for all MDs, right? Doesn't make sense, does it? But what makes sense is we're all still trying to figure it out. Here, here's my, my closing to this. I implore you, fight for the way you think you're most productive, okay? Don't settle for other people to tell you how you're most productive. And if you can't be productive the way you feel you're you can be productive in the company you're in, sorry bosses out there, move. Because that doesn't make you productive there. That doesn't make you happy. I'm a boomer, but I'm still looking for work-life balance. And I am looking to be productive my way. I think we have one more. Gary, I wanted to say I really like the idea of the productivity tools. And I've got a team that wants to record every meeting and put the transcribe capability on. Then I'm in this session a month ago with a lot of people that probably were in this room too, and we were told the security of that is eminent. You are now putting nuggets of information of your company in a way that could easily be shared outside of your company or talk to HR. They're now scared to death that every conversation that happens between an employee and a manager could be transcribed or recorded in the same way. What do we do with that? I got two, there's, there's two questions there and I know we're over time so I gotta speak fast. One, the security. Figure out the security. Look, we figured out how to do data at rest. Now we have to figure out data in use, right? We're a technologist, right? We can figure this out, it's not hard. Look at, look at us. We don't educate our LLMs by your data. So if you come and you ask a question, no one else is gonna get the privilege of that there. So I think look for the companies that aren't addressing their LLMs. The second part has always been a problem, right? Legal and compliance, for the lawyers in the, in the room, please don't get mad at me, they would rather have no data and argue in court than data. I got that. But we have to trust our employees are gonna say the right things in the meetings and that we can't be afraid that every single thing we're gonna do is not for productivity but for problems, right? And I think we just need to change that, right? But the first one on security, look, the banks figured it out, the law firms figured it out, the manufacturing companies figured it out. All companies will figure out where their data is and how to keep it secure in an AI world or that won't be a company soon. We have to go. Perfect way to end this panel. Thank you very much. Uh, please join Thanks me so in much for your thanking question. Gary for being here. Okay. It was a pleasure, sir. Thank you so much.